Welcome everyone. My name is Pyle Wooten and I'm a vice president with the client growth team here at Cedar. I have the honor of facilitating today's discussion with three impressive women in healthcare, who I will introduce momentarily. First, I want to acknowledge our audience and what an impressive turnout. I'm thrilled to see such a high attendance for this session. Our audience includes those in healthcare technology and innovation, Cedar employees and friends, as well as Cedar clients. Before we dive into today's panel, I want to share a bit about how this event will be structured. We will be taking questions from the audience today, and we really do want to hear from you. So please chime in within the Hop and Stay chat thread, and that way the panelists and I can fold your questions into today's discussion. The event will last about one hour. Now let's introduce our esteemed lineup of leaders who will be discussing how patient loyalty improves revenue. Deborah Gregory is Vice President of Revenue Cycle Management at Florida Cancer Specialists, where she oversees the RCM team for the medical oncology business, ancillary services, patient financial services, pair contracting, and credentialing. She joined FCS in February 2019 and brings more than 25 years of healthcare experience with seven years focused in oncology. Gail Kosla is Executive Vice President of System Financial Services for RWJ Barnabas Health. New Jersey's largest integrated academic healthcare delivery system and a partner of Rutgers University. In her role, Gail leads financial operations for the health system, including treasury services, financial reporting and planning, revenue cycle, and supply chain. Amy Katnick is Chief Operating Officer at Apollo MD. With over 32 years of experience, Amy brought her extensive healthcare knowledge to Apollo MD in 2009. Throughout her tenure with Apollo MD, she has been responsible for instituting a highly re responsive reputation, as well as the restructure of management teams within the organization. Amy has thoughtfully hired a well-versed and efficient team and has shifted the culture to reflect a more employee and physician friendly environment. Thank you all so much for being here. With that, let's get started. I wanna kick off with the topic that has affected all of us in some way, shape or form, and that's the pandemic. So our first question for the panel, can you talk about how the pandemic has affected your strategies around patient engagement and loyalty? And the second part of that question, how you've pivoted over the past almost two years now to keep those plans on track? I can start with that. Um, probably very similar to um, others. It's focusing on telehealth, being able to offer that, you know, face-to-face -face with the patient even if they're not able to come in. So giving them options during the pandemic. And then along that lines as well, um, watching what the payer um, uh, guidelines are um, for telehealth, um, staying on top of that and the public health emergency. Um, so that's been something that we've been keeping a close eye on as well. Um, another challenge is, is how we deal with the visitors um, and, you know, sometimes that's if, if we're not able to have the, the visitors come in with the patients, you know, allowing them to be on their cell phones to be able to hear and engage with the, the visit for the patient. Yeah, and I would, I would say uh, over the past two years, it's been a constant pivot of what is up next, right? So, you know, first we were dealing with testing. Um, I think uh, telehealth certainly, and I was, it, I think it was remarkable for the whole industry of how we kind of came together and brought something live so quickly that had been taking a long time to uh, produce. So I would echo my, my uh, colleague. Uh, and, then, and then now vaccines. So rolling out vaccines, making sure that patients and, and our community is uh, able to access uh, their needed vaccines and, and boosters. <clears throat> okay. Well, a little bit related to that, um, and I think this segues into the consumer-centric experience um, and, and how the pandemic has shifted a, a lot of how we do things. So for a long time, cr creating that consumer-centric experience in healthcare wasn't a strong area of focus. And that's changing now, partly due to patient expectations around their digital experience. What's the financial value of devoting more attention to the people your organizations serve? I'll start with that one if you want. 
Um, we had started our patient-centered strategy prior to the pandemic, but being sensitive to the pandemic and, and the circumstances surrounding COVID and loss of jobs and income, it became necessary to escalate these initiatives very, very quickly and much more critical. So we had to create a way for patients to be able to work through the issues surrounding the financial obligations and meet them in a way that they wanted to meet them in a manner that definitively decided for them how to pay, when to pay, you know, how to manage this themselves. And, you know, along with the changing healthcare landscape, the fact that the fully insured policies with just co-pays have gone away and we've moved toward consumer centric pay, the ability to handle this themselves was, was, critical at that point. It's become more the norm with high deductibles and, you know, the younger patient population, which creates much more digital engagement, we've discovered. Um, it just made sense to, to move toward a more technology-based environment for patient payments and allowing them to manage this themselves. Gail, would you add anything to, to Amy's comments there? Um, no, I, I agree with those. I, I mean, I think that, um, you know, healthcare is an interesting, it's, it's an interesting, interesting industry because we ourselves are, are consumers. And I think, you know, especially for women, we're making a lot of healthcare decisions for our families, um, you know, whether we've been uh, part of, uh, of our own health issues or for our children, our, our parents in some cases. Um, I think that that loyalty piece um, is, is huge. And, you know, we all want to go to a, a high quality provider. And I think that's the, you know, the first standard, the leveling piece, but we also want it easy. We want to, mm -hmm. we want to be able to access uh, our care easily. We want to be able to access our records easily. So, um, I think with the technologies that we have today, um, if you, if you're fortunate to be able to implement those, I think that that gives you a, um, an advantage. No, I agree. I think um, clearly cost is, is a, a critical component of, of patient engagement and how we meet them where they're at. And so if we think about a single patient and their lifetime health spending, um, we've seen is worth about 1.4 million per person or for a little over 4 million per family. What are some of the things you found to be effective in enhancing patient loyalty and cultivating those lifelong relationships while balancing um, the financial impact that they're facing. Um, as Amy indicated earlier, you know the the expense to our patients continues to increase. Um, one of the the things that we focus on at Florida Cancer Specialist is the financial assistance programs, um, and understanding what foundations are out there that will support our patients and their specific disease states. There's also um, copay assistance um, that we're able to help uh, facilitate for our patients. So in our clinics, we have financial counselors that will meet with the patients, help them to understand their financial um, portion of for their services. And then we have a separate team of financial assistant um, uh, collect billers and collectors that will then help the patient to apply for these various foundations or copay programs, and then um, help to um, continue to monitor and ensure that those funds are collected. So that's been um, something that we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from our patients, that they appreciate our assistance with that. Other thoughts on um, just how, you know, we talked a little bit about, right, Gail, all of us being consumers. Mm -hmm. And so for patients to feel less, they are consumers, but less like consumers yeah. and more like organizations really do care and are there for them right. in their times of need. Because obviously if they're coming in for healthcare services, they're facing some some sort of challenge. Yeah, I, I, I call it the, the high tech, high touch. You know, we, we want to have that tech behind us but at the end of the day, we want to feel cared for and we want to feel like, you know, we belong within a system and that somebody's looking out for us. Uh, I know for myself, um, you know, I've, I've dealt with some serious health issues in the past. And, um, you know, at that point in time, the system was very fragmented. 
and I see when I get care today that my record follows me and that's the tech piece. But then when I, when I need the comfort or I need the care coordination, I want to have a person, I want to have the touch that I can go to. So I think that's a, it's a winning formula to have that high tech, high touch. So piggybacking a little bit on that, that high tech, high, high touch um, concept, what role does technology play maybe more broadly in your focus on the patient experience? So improving the convenience, the flexibility, um, end to end from pre-visit to billing, how does that help to boost um, loyalty and retention? I mean, I can start with that since I left off on the last comment. I think that, um, you know, retention, I go to the same place every year for my, my mammogram because they have access to my record from last year and they have all the pieces of my record right there. I don't have to repeat anything. I don't have to worry about forgetting to bring something or bring something to my doctor to read later. And I think that that's the, that's the tech piece. And I think we've we've struggled in this industry for a very long time in pulling that together. And it's, it's great to see that, that happening. So from, you know, from access of the point of time, I make my, my appointment all the way down to payment. I've got it all right there. And that's the, that's the tech piece. And it looks so simple and it seems so simple, but it's, it's not it's very complex. We all know, um, you know, what kind of uh, regulatory issues we deal with in this, in our, in our industry. I would echo that. People do not want to have to reinvent the wheel every time they go to a new clinician, even if it's in the same practice. Mm -hmm. They want to feel like that someone's read and looked at the record and they're moving their care forward, not taking steps backwards. And the only way to do that is to apply technology to these pieces. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll echo that as well. Um, it's really important that, you know, we really partner with our technology vendors um, as we have with Cedar. And you know, Gail mentioned the demand for patients now to, to have options. So whether that be they, they contact us um, via chat to inquire about their bills or send emails or call, they, you know, um, this has allowed us to have more options to our patients. And um, the, the, the consumers now, they want to use that chat function, which, you know, that wasn't a normal, um, you know, function that we had. Um, so that's been nice to, to offer that. So pivoting a, a bit um, to the clinical care side um, and along the same themes of what we've been talking about, uh, when patients come back over time, there's in one regard less onboarding, um, fewer redundant screenings and tests, other efficiencies that you gain, um, and those costs really add up. What changes have you made um, to the care experience that have resulted in what you've seen as quantifiable differences in, in patient retention? So are there any strategies that have been effective um, when you think about uh, the care side of, side of things? I can start with that since 85% uh, of a pollen deep business is emergency medicine. So they usually come in through the front door there. Um, We've worked definitively hard to make sure the front end processes are smooth and seamless and that we're trying to start the care as much as possible up front so the patients don't have to wait to be seen because the time to clinician is probably the most important time. I mean, most patients want to get in, get out, and get home unless they're going to be admitted and they're sick. So we've worked very hard on making sure the front end processes in the emergency department are as smooth as possible. And you have to use technology for that. You have to be able to access their old records. You got to be able to make sure that you have all their their med reconciliations done, all those type of things that require tons of technology. You know, I would say that we're more of a, a work in progress. We have um, a, a large footprint across the state of New Jersey, and we've grown up over time through through acquisition and and building our network. And so if you use any of our facilities independently, there's a lot of continuity in there with the with the technology. But if you start to move to other places, that's disparate. And that's it. It's a huge strategy for us is to try to pull that together to go on one common record across our system and we have a lot of lives that we can touch in that way and a lot of um, uh, individuals that I think will be very satisfied with that end product. 
but it is a it's a it's a big investment and it's a big investment not just in dollars but in time staff and um, uh, I think it'll be very effective. So you spoke a little bit about uh, staff, but kind of leading into the other thought I have here is, is if it's true, patient, loyal patients are invaluable. Um, driving down costs, boosting revenue, not to mention obviously producing healthier outcomes. What are some of the struggles healthcare leaders face um, in improving retention? I know we talked a little bit about staffing, but financial barriers, bandwidth, um, other things that, that you feel get in the way of, of being able to achieve that goal. Uh, staffing has definitely been a challenge, um, whether it be because um, employees that are in the clinics are taking advantage of opportunities to work remote. Um, that's That's been a big challenge of ours. Um, also, um, just the competition between healthcare organizations, you know, we're, and, and even like restaurants, I mean, you'll see all, all of us, healthcare providers and non-healthcare providers, we're, we're struggling and fighting for those non-clinical positions. Um, so it, it kind of gets to be a bidding war. Um, so it is very challenging, um, you know, to, to try to look at your benefit packages, see how we can continue to um, improve and offer more for our staff so that they are um, enticed. Um, and, and then also it gets to leadership. You know, how, how can we, you know, even if we can't compete from a financial standpoint, you know, how can we assure them that we're here to support them, provide them the tools that they need to do their, their jobs effectively and have a good um, environment for them to work in? Yeah, it's challenging. It's challenging, and then things like pandemics get in the way, and <laughs> so you know. I mean, it's it's. I think every day we we probably you know my colleagues and I on the panel deal with, you know, you're 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 trying to build a strategy, but then every day gets in the in the way, and and not in the way, but it's it's a priority, and there are fires, and um, and I think you know just dealing with with the day to day. But you have to set that time aside, I think, to to build your strategy to to build for the future, um, and to build that that more of that membership as opposed to a transactional type um, healthcare healthcare enterprise. Have uh, have all of you seen within your organizations that similar trend? I think that Deb touched on around um, the remote workflow uh, workforce, um, obviously a result of the pandemic. I think we all find ourselves not doing this in person <laughs> in our home offices. Um, what has been the impact, I, I think, as we think of traditional roles that were um, patient facing, um, like the financial counselors, for instance, that are now um, maybe telephonic or, or virtual different modes? And, and have you noticed an impact or feedback from patients around how that's, whether they prefer that or if they've seen um, a difference in sort of the support that they're receiving? I think ours has been fairly seamless. I mean, I, we had moved to trying to move remote right before the pandemic. Of course, that escalated with the pandemic, but it has been pretty seamless, I think, from that perspective in terms of, and technologies enabled that actually, clearly. Yeah, for, for ourselves, um, you know, the financial counselors meeting with our patients um, is is something that our patients really rely on, um, you know, over the course of their treatment. So have we did try to have them remote um, and, um, you know, the dependency within the clinics um, that, um, you know, because they were dependent within the clinics, it was uh, hard to keep them remote. So for our financial counseling positions, we have um, uh, put them back in the clinics, so we, we don't have them remote, but the rest of our revenue cycle staff um, are remote now. Yeah, and we have many of ours remote too. I would imagine Deb in the in oncology, that's a you know place where you, people wanna have that hands-on face-to-face. Um, we're trying to look for innovative ways to use artificial intelligence um, in some of our processes. 
um, looking at you know other other technology opportunities where we can be um, offline. Uh, I think that you know it, it does present a lot of opportunities. I think to recruit talent um, and not have to have them in an office in an office setting. So you know it gives it it really widens the area by which you can recruit people if you can make that work. I definitely agree with that. Mm-hmm. It gives you the whole United States to pull. <laughs> and more. <laughs> I'm interested um, in what have your organizations maybe done in terms of um, research around why patients come back or, or stay away. I know we get a lot of um, anecdotal feedback maybe at the point of service, but really trying to understand the why around loyalty. So we know um, just one negative experience, um, a review online can lead a patient uh, to switch providers or word of mouth, um, and it can worsen delay or avoid care. Um, is there anything you all are doing proactively to address this issue? Well, from our experience, the, um, the, the patient inherently believes the clinical team is good for the most part. What they don't always see is the empathy or the empatheticness mm-hmm. and the need to go the extra mile is critical. So the timeliness of the visit, the attention to their needs, um, thorough discharge instructions, et cetera, all those things, all those pieces have to be put in place to make sure that they feel when they leave that they've been thoroughly seen, heard, and felt from that perspective. Mm-hmm. So we do have you know, a whole patient clinical team that will go out on site, work with the entire emergency department and the nursing staff and the ancillary staff to make sure that everybody understands the goal of what needs to happen for the patient so that they feel that extra that extra time. That has been difficult through the pandemic. I will say that the teams have not been able to go on site and they've not wanted them to. So we have done virtual patient satisfaction boot camps and things like that. We've tried to pivot as much as we could to make sure that we're still meeting the needs of the patient and the hospitals and our, our client facilities as much as possible. We are now back on site in most cases, and I think that's probably more effective, but we we did pivot at that time to make sure that we were still meeting the needs to make sure that the patients felt that. Amy, to piggyback, I think you answered a little bit of it already, um, but there was a related question for you um, around the ED focus um, on front end processes. So I think you talked a little bit about the training in person, but the question is around, do you have clinical staff in the front receiving patients or are they registration clerical staff? No, they're clinical teams. I mean, Apollo MD does physicians um, and advanced practice clinicians. We don't do nursing or, or any registration staff. So our teams are out there trying to get the care started with the hospital's back end support and the nursing staff from the hospital. But we try to put either, you know, a physician or advanced practice clinician right out in front to try to start the care. I think that's that's critical. Well, let me get um, a bit more specific here, and I'm going to um, sort of ask um, this questions targeted and geared towards each of you individually within your organizations and roles. Um, and so I'll start with Deb. Um, Deb, as we know, you oversee the RCM team for F- Florida Cancer Specialists, um, and you have previous work experience in oncology. Can you share how you think about the patient experience, retention, the topics we've talked about, Um, in such a sensitive field where patients are vulnerable? um, And how does that empathetic um, piece um, factor into your role? Sure. Um, You know, Amy mentioned empathy earlier, and it's huge. Um, And for the role of revenue cycle, usually the the first contact, face-to-face contact with, um, with the revenue cycle staff is the financial counselor, which again, you know, gives the emphasis of us having those positions um, in the clinic. Um, So it really starts with making sure that we're hiring the the right skill set to to manage those rough conversations, very tough conversations with the patients who've been diagnosed with cancer. And then you're, you're putting an employee in front of that patient to talk with them about their financial responsibility of this, you know, significant disease. So it takes a special person. And um, so I'm, I'm truly blessed with having a great leadership team um, over the financial counselors 
who they they've been in those positions. They understand, you know, what it takes to have that conversation and that follow through with our patients. So um, really focusing on um, hiring those that the staff that truly can can um, empathize with our patients and have that follow through um, that they need. So um, the other thing is we consistently challenge ourselves um, on how to improve that patient financial experience for our patients. Um, and we've talked about it several times, I think almost in every question is it's technology. Technology allows us to be more efficient um, and, and to be able to make sure that we're submitting that claim on behalf of the patient the first time and it's a clean claim that gets paid on first pass. And technology can pay, play a very big role in either the success or failure of that. So our team, we continue to challenge ourselves on how can we look at ways to automate um, and, and implement those abilities to, to improve our efficiencies and our accuracy. Thank you, Deb, that was great. Um, Gail, I'll go to you next. Uh, a few months ago, you were promoted at RWJ Barnabas Health to EVP of System Financial Operations. Congratulations. Can you talk with us about how you envision your role in a business model that supports revenue while you're still focused on building that patient loyalty and, and providing high quality care? Yeah, and I and I appreciate the opportunity to go after after Deb because um, her example or her response really resonated with me. But I, I see my role as an amazing opportunity to tie my professional experience in the provider space to actually my personal experiences as a patient, a mom, um, family health care uh, decision maker, if you will. Um, and I want to I want to build on the model that we that our organization has already started to uh, put the patient first. And, um, you know, Deb, Deb's uh, answer resonated with me because I'm a cancer survivor and uh, more than 10 years ago went through a cancer diagnosis, uh, not in my current health system, but I was struck by how difficult it was to navigate a system that I had been part of on the other side of the aisle, if you will, um, as an astute healthcare uh, industry leader, it was, it was very difficult to navigate. And so that is something that I would like to see our organization excel at. And that is giving that patient that, that, as I said before, that high tech, high touch, where I feel like I'm part of something. I feel like people are taking care of me. And, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the finance piece of it. That's a hard, that's a hard piece for people especially when they're going through a dire diagnosis and having that empathy um, to work with them, but, but also having all of the information and material right there. So the patient doesn't have to repeat all of that. They can get to their next um, care point easily. And, you know, that's what, what I would like to see happen. I'd, I'd like to see other women or other people who are dealing with illnesses have that experience. Thank you, Gail. That's incredibly inspiring. And I think it was um, mentioned earlier around how we are all consumers of healthcare as well as workers in healthcare. So I think it only plays into how we bring a lot of that into the solutions that we, we think about because it is our families, ourselves, um, our neighbors that are in those positions. So thank you so much um, for sharing. Amy, uh, as the COO at Apollo MD, how does patient retention and engagement connect with supporting organizational growth and your network of clinicians? So patient loyalty um, and its impact on strategic decision making. <laughs> and what is your approach to balancing operational efficiency with meeting um, and ultimately exceeding patient needs? Well, clearly, um, patient satisfaction is the most important thing and it should it should form your strategic decisions and your growth, organizational growth, if you're doing a good job. And so it has to be the focus at all times of how is the patient being treated throughout this whole, you know, healthcare continuum. So we think about it all the time about when they come in the door, what are they seeing? How are they being handled? How long does it each part of it take? To, how long does it take to get to a bed? How long does it take for them to get their tests done? All those pieces 
will impact the way the physicians and, and advanced practice clinicians can, can do their jobs and perform their roles. So we think about it continually. And so that's why we put the clinical support teams in to go out there and help work through the processes to make sure it goes as, as seamlessly as possible. And then of course, as you both addressed previously, once they get the bill, you want to make that as seamless as possible too, because that's when they'll suddenly get very upset and remember some things like, oh gosh, that didn't go as well as I thought. So we want to make each piece of it as seamless as possible with technology. But to do that, you've got to do a lot of work on the front end. You've got to go on the site. You've got to work with each team. You've got to decide how each process is handled. And it may be different at each hospital. Every hospital is going to have a little bit of a different slant or vent on things or departments are, are done differently. But you've got to get complete buy-in from the leadership at the top and then start down and trickle down. And if it's important to them, it will be important to everyone. And I, I think that's critical. And it, it, it drives everything we do at Apollo MD. Thank you, Amy. Uh, we do have a question um, from the audience I want to share, and it again plays really well into your, your last comments there, Amy. Um, how do you create that buy-in from a CEDAR leadership standpoint for something like patient um, experience? I know in, in my roles in the past, sometimes those softer um, things that we're, we're shooting for are harder to kind of get prioritized and pushed forward. So how do you think about that and, and look to, to get the collaboration and buy-in? We definitely want an executive sponsor, someone on the executive team who wants to own this. And then we make sure that we have a nursing sponsor as well as a physician sponsor mm -hmm. and an advanced practice clinician sponsor. We even want environmental services involved. I mean, you really want somebody from each department to take ownership in this so that they help promote it and push it or it won't be successful. And then you can't just rest on your laurels once it's done once. You've got to go back and revisit a lot of these things. I mean, we have a 10-step process that you do one thing a week and ingrain it all the way through the process. Mm -hmm. And that definitely helps to get you know the, the buy-in you need, but you got to start with an executive sponsor. Gail or Deb, would you add anything from, from your perspectives around that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just agree wholeheartedly. I mean, I think that that, that culture has to be there. It's, it's really a, a change in culture and that comes from the executive leadership. And, um, you know, I like how uh, Amy talked about having even environmental support. I mean, I think you, you need to have everybody row in the boat the same way. And um, important uh, to, you know, to cross check and look back later, is it still working? And where did it maybe fail? And how, how do we make it stronger? So I, I agree with that. It's gotta be muscle memory. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. and I. I, I agree. Um, and just with a, a strong emphasis at getting physician buy-in and support as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, thankfully, um, especially in, in, you know, oncology, you know, they, they see and understand the importance of the patient experience, um, complete patient experience, not just the clinical, but also from the time they check in, um, you know, to their financial overall financial experience as well. So another question from the audience around that patient experience thread, um, does the patient experience journey mapping take place and is it used or would it be valuable in improving key touch points in the care cycle? Yeah, so um, one thing that we've done in a, a couple of situations, um, we have um, an operational excellence team um, that helps us um, in applying like the lean Six Sigma principles. And we just from the revenue cycle side, we did a value stream map um, to map out the patient's experience of coming into the clinic and how they they um, the each um, like stop point within their visit mm -hmm. and how that um, really equates to their bill. And, you know, what are the opportunities that we can improve? Um, so having it mapped out really allowed us to look at the quantity of, of um, opportunities you know, whether it's we we didn't get the records up front or whether we didn't uh, weren't able to validate the insurance um, up front and helps us to prioritize where where our biggest um, gaps and the biggest opportunities are. So 
I think, you know, even in revenue cycle, um, you know, mapping out that patient experience is, is something that you can learn a lot from. Yeah, and I think I think trying to you know even even secret shop yourself and go on and say mm -hmm. okay how do I how do I find a physician in my own health system and mm -hmm. you know clicking the various buttons and and you you find oh my gosh you know uh, I might have given up by now <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but uh, I I think that and um, also to Deb's point about the mapping I think also doing. Uh, more look back, you know, a root cause analysis, even on a revenue issue to say, okay, why did this happen? And, and how can we prevent it from happening again? I think uh, is important, not just fix that immediate problem, but go back and say, how did this, how, how was this created? And how do we, how do we fix that process? No, yeah, that's great. Um, we have a very active audience, which is great. Lots of questions from folks today. So I'm going to pivot to another one. And I think, Gail, you touched a little bit around this um, in terms of exploring AI. Um, but from Thomas, the question is, how are you applying AI, um, I think, currently in the customer engagement process? Um, I think, I mean, we're using more from, from processing um, processing uh, claims and um, uh, processing uh, registration information into into our databases. I'm not sure if I can think of a specific example. I don't know if my fellow panelists have. Yeah, open to everybody, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Definitely in the, in the front end of processing and confirming insurance ver verifications and things like that is, is clearly a good use of AI. But then on the back end, you can use it to develop empathetic messaging. I mean, we've worked with theater to do that. Um, someone paid their bill. Don't just send them another bill saying, here's another bill. Say, thank you for paying your bill. And, you know, here's another way to, to pay your bill. And then around potential discounting in the future. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at AI and all sorts of modalities to see what would work and what would be effective continually. And we can't stop. We got to keep, keep working on it too. I mean, none of us will rest on our laurels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the the information loop of learning about your your customers and how they behave is really a critical piece. Um, we are working with Cedar on a pilot, and I think that's that's exciting to me about uh, how um, we can learn from our our patients' past behaviors and then implement that into a um, a, a new way to um, to engage with them by looking at past behaviors. Yeah, I'll just add to as far as I'm working with with Cedar as well. It has been very interesting that you know they using the technology. You can find what what methodology does the um, the consumer, the patient, um, prefer to be communicated with, um, giving them the, those options and even understanding the time of day that they would um, typically respond. Um, it's um, it is fascinating. Um, what what can be done with technology now? So I want to maybe think um, as we talk a little bit about the future and looking towards the future, um, we know I think that consumer expectations will continue to rise in the coming years. I think some of it, as we've talked about, is accelerated with the pandemic and, and um, how people, not just just not as patients, but as people in general, we are looking for more convenience and have a higher bar for how um, tailored solutions are to us. Um, what kinds of initiatives are your organizations planning um, in order to thrive financially while you're also improving the continuity of your patients for the long haul? So anything you all can share in terms of future goals? Well, one of the initiatives that we've um, initiated is trying to follow up with patients who've been discharged home, whether it be from the emergency department or whether it be from in-house to make sure they're compliant with their medications and following up with their, their primary mm -hmm. care. I think that's critically important. Um, emergency medicine and hospital medicine, which are two of the specialties that we do, are very key in terms of making sure patients are staying well and staying out of the hospital. And so we were working diligently on trying to be a little bit more innovative in that regard. I don't know if it helps the bottom line much at all, but it definitely will help the patient's well-being. Yeah, and I think uh, along those lines, um, investing in social determinants of health 
um, working with our communities and with our with our patient base around things that are not traditionally healthcare related, but that do affect health. Because I think that um, you know, as as time goes by, we have an aging population. Um, we all know there's there's potentially future shortages. Um, we want to keep people healthy. Uh, we want to help them to um, to live their best life. And I think by by working with those with those items that are not traditionally healthcare, we can help with that. We are the next generation. Mm -hmm. that we'll be doing more hospital at home, I'm yes, sure. Right. <laughs> and for, for ourselves, for my department specifically, we're, we're continuing to focus on automation. How can we continue to, you know, like Amy said, don't, don't get, you know, um, happy with where you are. You know, you've got to continue to improve. And um, uh, for example, automated authorizations, um, you know, that is, is something that is definitely on my to-do list for 2022 um, to, to partner with a vendor and, and have that implemented, as well as um, providing more automation to our financial assistance programs. There's technology out there now that um, when we provide, enter in the patient's information, it would automatically provide us with the various foundations instead of us having to keep track of lists um, ourselves and understand who still has funds available, who doesn't. So those are two key technology um, areas that, that we're going to be focusing on. To, to kind of continue thinking through that a little bit, I know we um, you all have shared a few initiatives and, and sort of um, priorities that you're looking for in the future, and that involves additional technology solutions, vendors perhaps. We think about the, the patient experience and you know, ensuring that's seamless. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts around how to integrate these and, and what your strategy is a little bit around that to make sure from a patient standpoint, they still don't feel like these are segmented um, efforts, all of them obviously benefiting them, but they feel like this is a, it, it doesn't feel to them that they're interacting with different parts of, of your team. Yeah, and that, that's our, that is our key strategy or our key initiative right now that we're embarking on and is that that is to develop that common uh, electronic medical record across our across our health system, and um, you know it's a, it's a you know multi-year significant endeavor, um, but but well worth that because I think that's what the patients will get is that seamless experience across the continuum of our network, and I think that's very exciting. And then if we can link into that some of those community outreach efforts. Um, it really, it really will build a, a, a strong uh, network that you know pe where people feel that sense of belonging, and um, with that ease of access um, capability as well. Many, but a few more questions. We have um, questions from the audience. I know we wanted to save a little bit of extra time. Um, to take those questions um, from you all. So please do continue to submit. Um, in the meantime, uh, I didn't know if any of you kind of had any additional comments or, or thoughts around sort of, we've talked about a lot, right? We've talked about the patients from a technology standpoint, from an empathy and care and clinical delivery standpoint, um, maybe a little bit around what you feel like is the biggest, and I don't want to say like keeps you up at night, um, but what's the biggest pain point or challenge you see today, just given the different factors and limitations around what you hope to accomplish and, and what's getting in the way of actually being able to execute on that a little bit? I see that we've got to keep attuned to the next generation. I mean, generations keep changing and what our generation wants isn't what the older generation wants necessarily what the younger generation needs. We've got to make sure we're meeting them where they want to be met. Mm -hmm. You know, if they want paper statements, they get paper statements. If they want texts, they get texts, whatever it is they need or they want in terms of explanation, follow up, all of those type of things in terms of the revenue cycle component, we've got to make sure we keep attuned to that and keep abreast of it and hopefully ahead of it. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say it keeps me up at night, but it's, it's a thought. <laughs> 
The other thing is, and I, I think Gail mentioned it earlier, is from you know from one healthcare to assist to another, we're going to have patients that that cross care. So mm -hmm. how can we continue to um, expand our technology to allow our systems to talk to one another? Um, because the more that that you know, we can set up our system to obtain the the insurance information, patient demographic information, the healthcare information from from the primary care physician who's referring the patient to the oncologist, then you know that that helps to reduce the cost and keep the overall expense down. Right. Yeah, it, it's a it's a constantly changing environment, and I think that's the that's the thing that you know you you. You, we talk about wanting to keep ahead of it, and then we're dealing with also um, some of the regulatory issues that are out there, shortages, um, major supply chain issues now, shortage of labor, and you know it, you you have to get beyond that because we, we need to we need to be able to deliver. Um, but those are those are challenges, and they and they sort of rear their head every day. I mean, you you know we. Um, just a, a hardware uh, and availability of hardware and, and um, you know, it's sitting out in a container ship somewhere. And <laughs> so, you know, there, there's your initiative, but you, you have to be creative and you have to say, okay, how do we, how do we get past that and deal with it anyway? And so time mm -hmm. is constantly moving. So I think that's the, that's the challenge that we all face um, mm -hmm. in, in trying to ready ourselves and keep ahead of the curve. And use your staff in innovative ways. You know, mm -hmm. if you have a nursing shortage, maybe you bring paramedics in and try to utilize them, top of license and things like that. So mm -hmm. we've all had to really think outside the box. Yeah. We can't take advantage or can't can't make any assumptions with our staff. You got to show appreciation to each and every staff member. They're mm -hmm. just beyond critical. Yeah. One of the um, topics I think y'all have brought up through this conversation a couple of times is around the regulatory piece. Um, and I guess I have a question if, if uh, while we're waiting for some more to come in. Um, one of the things I know several organizations have been focused on is the No Surprise Act. Um, and I think that ties into patient experience and trying to, it, uh, the spirit of the legislation to address some of that. So can you speak maybe at all about um, your approach and, and your response to how you're teeing up for next year and, and the implementation of that. That is a super loaded question. <laughs> Especially in the UD. <laughs> I know. Especially in the emergency department where, you know, we have, we obviously have to take every patient that walks in the door, mm -hmm. regardless of their ability to pay. And we do, and that's the right thing to do all the time. So, as a company, we strive to be in network always. That's just the goal. You do not want to be out of network. Um, and in today's environment, it can be challenging if um, people don't want to pay as much as they feel like they should have to pay. So then you come to an impasse. And that's I think that's where we are right now, that nobody wants surprises to patients, particularly mm -hmm. us. So we, we're trying to get to a place where we can all deal with this in a fashion that meets patient needs. Yeah. And I think that partners have to, uh, providers have to partner together to to work on that. I mean, I, I know, um, you know, various special specialists don't feel that they're fairly compensated by payers, so they go out and network. But I think we we have to work together for the good of our patients to, to figure that out. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of times that involves partnering and coming to some agreement of, um, you know, within within that within that network. No, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, any other sort of? I have about ten minutes to wrap up a little bit, but any other um, kind of general comments or takeaways from this group that you can share as we think about just the topic of our our panel today at large and more broadly? I know we dug into a lot of. Um, specific questions and topics, um, but anything that as you're thinking about this, um, and, you know, I'm sure there's short-term plans, long-term plans, but any uh, takeaways or last uh, comments you all can share with us? I think um, the biggest takeaway I have from utilizing the Cedar platform and moving on to the Cedar platform was 
how much patients really like to have control of it themselves, how they pay, mm -hmm. when they pay, not having to actually talk to a live person has been a positive. Um, they said that, you know, they, it avoids the embarrassment of having to say, I can't pay my whole bill. What can I pay? Things like that. So allowing them to set up a payment plan and move forward from there has been hugely beneficial. And to get a, a really positive patient experience from paying a bill is dramatic to me. So that's been enlightening. And we look at all the patient comments regularly every single week and look and follow back up on, on some of them if it's important. So it's, it's been a, a, a great boon for us in feeling like we're engaged with the patients on a, on a lot of different levels. I, I would echo that. Um, Glennis, who's over our customer service team, um, you know, she's, she's been um, one of the biggest uh, supporters of Cedar and um, the technology that we've implemented. And the, it has been um, uh, very nice to see the positive comments um, and they really do enjoy having the options. Um, and as I mentioned before, chat was an option that we didn't have before. Um, that's really helped with our overall efficiency, having different ways that the patient can communicate um, with our customer service staff if they have any questions. So it's, it's been a, a very nice um, experience for us. I think one of, one of my, take, my key takeaways is something, you know, that I've been, been thinking about a lot is this concept of patient experience. And, um, you know, you, and I think somebody said it, maybe Amy, before you have a great uh, clinical experience and then you get the bill. And, you know, it's, it's, it, is, it is a really a holistic approach to patient experience. It has to be from appointment time to, you know, time of paying the bill and that we, we need to, as organizations, be proactive about that and, um, you know, set goals and, and try to live in the shoes of our patients and experience what they're experiencing so that we can, we can make it a great experience. Well, thank you, ladies. I have to say, um, what struck me a little bit as, as you all were talking is, um, you know, the, the synergy between a lot of how you're looking at things and the trends. And I know at Cedar how we're looking to incorporate a lot of that, whether it's the patient survey feedback, um, continuing to monitor sort of on the back end, the trends that we're seeing around what's most effective. Um, types of communications, timing of communication. So I, I um, you know, naturally look forward to the continued partnership with all of your organizations around that um, and great things to come. Um, I also wanna thank each of you for taking the time to share your perspective with all of us today. Um, I know this was a pleasure for me to be able to hear from you all directly. Um, and I know it was a lot of time and effort that you all have put in uh, to, to crafting your responses. So thank you so much. Um, for your time and thoughts, and I hope everybody has a good rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. You as well.